From a series of arch-topped doorways lining the circumference of the room came the sounds of solemn chanting as perhaps three dozen of the Order's black-robed members began to file in and take their places along the perimeter of the canted circle. Last to emerge was the high official who wore a mask and carried the circular emblematic pendant draped over both hands, which he held as if in prayer. Rituals of similar sort had been enacted by the ancient Sith, Plagueis thought, as Larsh Hill genuflected before the high official. At the same instant Hill's right knee touched the polished stone, a jangle of foreboding laddered up Plagueis's spine. Turning ever so slightly, he saw that 114D had rotated its head toward him in a gesture Plagueis had come to associate with alarm. The dark side fell over him like a shroud, but instead of acting on impulse, he restrained himself, fearful of betraying his true nature prematurely. In that instant of hesitation, time came to a standstill, and several events happened at once. The high official gave a downward tug to the pendant he had placed around Hill's neck, and the old mule's head toppled from his shoulders and began to roll down the tipped stage. Blood geysered from Hill's neck, and his body fell to one side with a thud and began to jerk back and forth as one after another of his hearts failed. Yanking their hands from the roomy opposite sleeves of their robes, the hooded members of the order made sidelong throwing motions which sent dozens of decapitated discs screaming through the air. Munes to both sides of Plagueis fell to their knees, their last breaths caught in their throats. A disc buried deep in his forehead, one of the sun guards twirled in front of Plagueis like a crazed marionette. Blood fountained, turning to mist, struck in at least three places and leaking lubricant. 114D was trying to limp to Plagueis's side when another disc whirled into its alloy body, touching off a storm of sparks and smoke. Plagueis pressed his right hand to the right side of his neck to discover that a disc had made off with a considerable hunk of his jawbone and neck, and in its cruel passing had severed his trachea and several blood vessels. He cupped the force against the injury to keep himself from lapsing into unconsciousness, but he fell to the floor regardless, with blood pumping onto the already slick stone circle. Around him, slanted in his faltering vision, the assassins had drawn vibroblades from the other sleeves of the robes and were beginning a methodical advance on the few munes who were still standing. A hail of bolts streaked from the blaster, cradled in the arms of the remaining sun guard, sweeping half a dozen hooded beings off the rim of the circle before he himself was butchered. Tricked, Plagueis thought, as pained by the realization as he was by the wound. Oh, maneuvered by a group of inferior beings who at least had had sense enough to place artfulness above arrogance. Slumped on his right side, knees drawn up to his chest, eyes open but unmoving, Plagueis watched the second Ichane succumb to multiple stabs from the assassin's vibroblades. With blood welling out from under Plagueis' cupped right hand, and glistening in a pool on the floor beneath his neck. They had taken him for dead. But now they were moving from the body of one fallen mune to the next, checking for signs of life and finishing what they had begun. A few had lowered their black hoods, revealing themselves to be Maladians, the same group Sidious had employed to deal with Vidar Kim. For an instant he wondered if Sidious had secretly taken out a second contract, but he immediately dismissed the thought born as it was of his not wanting to admit to himself that the Grand had bested him. He wondered if the Maladians had actually been bold enough to kill the prominent canted circle members they were impersonating. Unlikely, given that the assassins were known and respected for their professionalism. The members had probably been rendered unconscious by gas or some other means. Not a meter away stood 114D, five decapitator discs protruding from his alloy body and telltale lights blinking in the midst of a self-diagnosis routine. Having run himself through a similar test, Plagueis knew that he had lost a great deal of blood and that one of his subsidiary hearts was in fibrillation. 
Sith techniques had helped him perform chemical cardioversions on his other two hearts, but one of them was working so hard to compensate that it too was in danger of becoming arrhythmic. Plagueis moved his eyes just enough to fix the locations of some of the two dozen assassins that had survived the Sun Guard's counterattack. Then he dug deep into the Force and catapulted himself to his feet. The closest of the assassins swung to him with raised vibroblades and rushed forward, only to be flung backward off the canted stage and against the room's curved walls. Others Plagueis felled with his hands by snapping necks and putting his fists through armored torsos. Spreading his arms wide, he clapped his hands together, turning every loose object in the vicinity into a deadly projectile. But the Meladians were far from run-of-the-mill murderers. Members of the cult had killed and wounded Jedi, and in response to confronting force powers, they didn't shrink or flee, but simply changed tactics, moving with astounding agility to surround Plagueis and wait for openings. The wait lasted only until Plagueis attempted to unleash lightning. His second subsidiary heart failed, paralyzing him with pain and nearly plunging him into unconsciousness. The assassins wasted not a moment, throwing themselves at him in groups, though in a vain attempt to penetrate the force shield he raised. Again he rallied, this time with a ragged sound dredged from deep inside that erupted from him like a sonic weapon, shattering the eardrums of those within ten meters and compelling the rest to bring their hands to their ears. In blinding motion, his hands and feet smashed skulls and windpipes. He stopped once to conjure the force wave that all but atomized the bodies of six Meladians. He spun through a turn, dragging the wave halfway around the room to kill a half a dozen more. But even that wasn't enough to deter his assailants. They flew against him again, making the most of his momentary weakness to open gashes on his arms and shoulders. Down on one knee, he levitated a sun guard blaster from the floor and called it toward him but one of the assassins succeeded in altering its trajectory by hurling himself into the path of the airborne weapon. With nothing more than the force of his mind, Plagueis rattled the floor, knocking some of the assassins off their feet, but others rushed in to take their places, slashing at him with their vibroblades from every angle. He knew that he had life enough to conjure one final counter-offensive. He was a moment from loosing hell on the Meladians when he sensed Sidious enter the room. Sidious and Saint Pestage, in whose hands a repeating blaster fashioned a hell of its own, a barrage of light that separated limbs from torsos, hooded heads from cloaked shoulders. Hurrying to Plagueis' side, Sidious lifted him upright, and in unison they brought swift death to the rest. In the stillness that followed, 114D, glistening with leaked lubricant, re-enabled itself and walked stiffly to where the two Sith were standing. Syringes grasped in two of its appendages. Magister Damask, I can be of service. Plagueis extended his arm toward the droid and then lowered himself to the floor as the drugs began to take effect. He lifted his gaze to Pestage, then glanced at Sidious, who in turn showed Pestage a look that made abundantly clear he had become a member of their secret fraternity, whether he wanted to or not. Master, we need to leave at once, Sidious said. What I felt, the Jedi may have felt, and they will come. Let them, Plagueis rasped. Let them inhale the aroma of the dark side. This carnage is beyond explanation. We can't be here. After a moment, Plagueis nodded and summoned a gurgling voice. Recall the Sun Guard. When they're done here... No, Sidious said. I know where the Gran are. It won't be business as usual this time, Master. <laughs>